Baruch Hashem. Today's, today's, we're up to chapter 29, verse 15. I want to dedicate our Torah study to the brave men and women serving in Sahel. My nephew is in, uh, I spoke to him today. He had take, even though he had served two tours already uh, in this war, uh, he's on reserves. He got a call and he had finally taken a week off and he had gone out of the country with permission, obviously. And they called him back and he's going to the north. So we he's just one example of the many, many people, thousands of people put their lives on hold to serve the Jewish people as part of Tzahal. So we we dive in for we 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 study in gratitude to them and their merit and we dive into Hashem that yeah. Many of them are moving to the from the south to the north now that the they, the army has said we've shifted our focus to the north now. The army has said that we've shifted our focus to the north. But he was, he's in reserves. They called up reserves units. Yeah, they called them up. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I visited him in the north in his unit and they were ready. Okay, chapter 29, verse 15. Ki atem yidatem yashavnu beres. Let's try him. You know how we pass through the midst of Egypt, and you know that which we pass through the nations through whom you passed. Oh, wait, Rashi. Well, we'll do the next passage first, then so we'll come back to the Rashi. And you saw their abominations, their idols, wood and stone, kesef v'zahav, Gold and silver are sharing Mahim. Gold and silver that was with them. That's what Rashi says about this. You know. You saw the nations who worship idols. And the heart of one of you might have persuaded him to follow them. Maybe there's a man or a woman amongst you. Therefore, you have to take an oath that you are not following them. You saw their abominations. Idols are called abominations because they are disgusting, like revolting creatures. So this is not politically correct to refer to another worship, faith community in that manner, but the Torah does it. And the Torah says they're detestable idols. Hello, Josh. Welcome joining us from the Bay Area. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Larry, come and visit again soon. Yes. So they, they're, uh, they're, they're detestable idols. Shem uh, Musrachim. They stink. Yes, J J um, Jerry. Yes. Uh, these are detestable things. When they uh, permit uh, human, human sacrifices to the idols, these are detestable things. I agree with you. I, I, I'm just saying that, yeah, I, I, the fact that it's objectively detestable doesn't stop people from saying we shouldn't criticize them. You can look at the Ivy League campuses if you want reinforcement of that. I agree with you that they, they did child sacrifice. They did, uh, they worshipped in revolting ways. The Torah, the Torah says when things are abominable. Today we have a fear of doing that. Today we have a fear of doing that, so you get canceled, cancel culture. They stink and are disgusting like excrement. Wood and stone, those of wood and stone you saw in the open. For the, for, for the non Jew who owned them was not afraid that they might be stolen. Those of silver and gold are with them. Meaning to say, they take their idols of wood and stone, they put them in public. But those in silver and gold are with them. They are in their tiled rooms because they're afraid that maybe they might be stolen. Verse 17. Uh, she the verse says, Maybe there's amongst you a man or a woman or a family or a shevet whose heart is turning today away from God to worship Maybe there's somebody who is amongst you a root growing gale and whorehound. 
That's what they call somebody who's turning away from you to worship the idols. They The Torah calls them a shoresh, a root growing gall and whorehound. Do you know what these terms are? Um, is that what it says there? It does. It says um, the gall is commonly referred to as hemlock. Well, that's us. We're we're on hemlock. So, yeah. it's, right. it's a bitter and perhaps poisonous plant, which are often used as a metaphor for evil. So there's somebody who's, maybe there's a man amongst you whose heart turns away today from accepting the covenant. He's the village heretic and he, he wants to destroy your energy. And he, the Torah calls him a root which grows a bitter herb, which are bitter, Rashi says. He grows and increases wickedness in your midst. The Talmud speaks of a medicinal, I'm reading the footnote, Talmud speaks of a medicinal herb called Agdina, being used in the treatment of the disease of the Pura. It is a bitter herb called white marubi in Old French, La'ana in Hebrew. The Targum calls it Gidin. This herb is called whorehound. In English, it is used today in certain cough syrups and other medicines. So they don't call it hemlock, but I guess Rabbi Steinzoltz has the tradition that it's hemlock. The call is hemlock. The whorehound he calls wormwood. Mm -hmm. Used in, in, uh, in also safaria. It says wormwood. Used in what? Mouthwash. Really? Yeah, it fills everything in the mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything in your mouth, <laughs> including you. <laughs> so, so wormwood, I guess, is like a bitter herb. That's what it must be. And a hemlock is poison. Other people identify it with a poppy. Mm -hmm. Poppy used to produce opium. Well, that'd be much, that probably tastes a lot better than hemlock. All right. So, so then the verse says, so When you hear this oath, and he blesses him, saying, Shalom Yeli. He says, don't worry, I'll do it on my own. I'll make Shabbos for myself. I'll have peace. I'll go through it. I'll go through it as my heart sees fit. Thereby adding the drunk with the thirsty. So basically, he's see, when a person hears this oath, he'll bless himself in his heart. Rashi says, Lashon bracha, expression of blessing. He'll think in his heart, a blessing of peace to himself, saying, these curses will not reach me. I'll have peace. This barech, and he'll bless himself like this galach. He shall shave himself. And he shall pray. I'll go as my heart sees fit. Rashi says, "I'll go in the vision of my heart, like Ashurenu v'lo karov." That which my heart sees fit to do. And then the, it's a strange, strange expression of the Torah, thereby adding the drunk with the thirsty. What does that mean? I'll add on a punishment for him, Rashi says. Wait, Nechama's educating us. Wormwood is very bitter and used in making absinthe. It contains tehujun, which is toxic. Okay, I'll avoid the wormwood also. So God says, because I'll add on a punishment for him for that which he has done until now, unintentionally. And I would have overlooked them. But now he calls that I should combine with them with that which was intentional. And I'll take my due from him for all of it. Meaning to say, I'm going to punish him now and I'll punish him for all the things which I also had already uh Avoided, but he was overlooked, but he were worthy of punishment. Yeah. I don't know. It's a strange expression. How does Rabbi Scheinzel's translate there by adding the drunk with the thirsty? 
Does he, what does he say? He says that um, the people who didn't know God are like the dry people. The people that have walked with God and watered once. And you shouldn't become dry just because you pass through the dry peoples. But if you mix them together, it's not a good thing. So you have to be careful. People have bad energy. They ruin it. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay. Hello, Ezra. Amazing. Amazing. Just go off to you. Yes, Jerry. There's a commentary that uh, this phrase, uh, moist and dry alike, is an expression meaning everything. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. That makes sense, too. That makes sense. Uh, she says the drunk means the unintentional. He acts like a man who is drunk. And the thirsty is the one who acts out of intent with desire. Okay. God will not be willing to forgive him. For then Hashem's anger and his wrath will smoke against that man. And the entire um, curse, which is written in this book, will be struck against him. And Hashem will erase his name from heavens. Rashi says, what does it mean Hashem's anger will smoke against that man? Through anger, the body heats up and smoke emerges from the nose. You know, so they're like the cartoons where you're like blowing smoke through your nose. I never saw anybody actually do that. But I guess you... <laughs> So the scripture lets the ear hear in the manner which it's custom to hear. I mean to say it's just an expression, figurative expression, talking about God getting angry, but it's not meant to be literally. And Kinato expresses rage. In French, it's empalement, outburst of emotion, uh, or the taking hold of vengeance. And Okay, yeah, Jerry, you had a question? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll take your hand down. I'll take your hand. Oh, you took it down already. Okay, verse 20. Yisrael. God will set him aside and punish him from all the tribes. You're going to get all these oaths, these curses that are written in this book. Rashi says, And above it says, any illness and any blow in this book of this Torah. I thought of something, by the way, I could just share with you that my daughter asked me, because we were mentioning the curses, my daughter said to me, what's the reason why we blow a hundred shofar blasts on Rosh Hashanah? There's a technical answer for this. Because on Rosh Hashanah, we blow a hundred shofar blasts. I wish a Snyder family could join us on Yom Kippur. You guys can come in. It would be amazing. It would be so beautiful. But anyway, so we'll have to Hear the hear this. I'm saying, why do we do a hundred shofar blasts on Rosh Hashanah? So the answer, the short answer is, technically speaking, we have to hear nine shofar blasts. But since we don't know what the sound of the cry is, if it's a shavarim or teruah or a shvarim teruah, everyone has to do a minimum of nine or ten, depending on how you count. But then, since we don't know, then you do all the combinations, you get to thirty. And then we don't know where you're supposed to blow, which part of the service in the uh, before the Amida, during the Amida, or after the Amida, you get to 90. And then the Talmud says that the source for the Tosafot says, since the person who cried, the chauffeur is the sound of a cry, and the person who cried in the Tanakh is actually a wicked person, uh, the mother of a wicked person, Sisra, who was very wicked, says his mother was looking out the window waiting for him to come home, and so she cried. Mm -hmm. And so so the Midrash says she sighed a hundred times, and Tosafot says that uh, 100 chauffeur blasts correspond to the mother of Sisera's crying. Mm -hmm. So it seems a little uh, crazy that in Rosh Hashanah we're blowing the chauffeur for Sisera's mother. Uh, I mean, not for Sisera's mother, but 
the source of how, how we bore the shofar is from Cicero's mother. And then I thought of another um, idea that uh, curses that we read in last week's portion, the curses that have come upon us are called the 100 curses minus two. So there are 100 curses that are listed as part of the curses in the last week's portion. Hey, 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 John, the, the soup is very schwach. Tomorrow night we got a lot of boys coming here, a lot of boys, and they're coming for the soup. They heard about it. Yeah, 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 I promise you. Okay, anyway, wait, join us, John, join us, join us. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, so I was thinking like this, that the 100 chauffeur blasts are the antidote to the curses. Mm. They correspond to the curses. The curses are 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 100 minus 2 is really 100. And the 100 chauffeur blasts were blasting away the curses. Mm. You know, this is our spiritual iron dome. Mm. We could defeat everything. The we spiritual iron dome. David Hashem or Ivishi 101 times. Oh, beautiful. Well, there's different, very nice Rabbi Yosef, and there's different, not to say that everybody has the idea that you blast the shofar a hundred times. There's different customs. Chabad, I think, has the custom of blasting it a hundred and one times. So every, so if you go to Chabad for, for diving or Rosh Hashanah, you'll get home late because they do it a hundred and one times, not a hundred. Okay. We go on to the next verse. The Amara Dora Haron, and the latter generation will say, your children, which will get up from after you, and the foreigner who comes from a faraway place, and they'll see the makot arts, they'll see the plagues of the earth, and its uh, illnesses with which it's afflicted. So, the whole world They'll come and they'll see that God is going to bring upon the earth sulfur and salt. The world will never, this area will never blossom. There will be nothing to grow there anymore. Like, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can look at uh, those nations that you know, it's like after a nuclear attack, like nothing grows there. Like look at the Chernobyl region where the nuclear reactor overflowed. Nothing could grow there anymore. Yeah. Chernobyl's an incredible dense uh, habitat full of all kinds of... Now, today? Yeah. Wow. wow. So I was wrong. So, so it was not devastated. It wasn't devastated. Well, yeah, it was. Just yeah. Yeah. But now it's back, you're saying? Yeah, because it looked too great. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. Very thick apples. I still wouldn't eat their vegetables, okay? I would not eat any vegetables coming out of there. I was involved for a very, very, very small period of my life. There was a friend of mine who was um, involved with a charity, helping all the kids from Chernobyl who got sick. A lot of, a lot of terrible, uh, terrible <laughs> tragedies came out from that terrible thing. One of the, the children that Chabad brought is here in Fredericton. Hopefully he had, a, he had his bar mitzvah and his shivat kfar chabad and hopefully he studies Torah with you every day. Hopefully, the amru kol gayim asher al maas Hashem kachol artsos and all the nations will see because you didn't listen and God destroyed this place. They'll say, why did God do this? Macharei afagadol is that? Why is God so angry? Amru al asher azvut brit Hashem because they abandoned the covenant. El kevotam. They abandoned the God of their forefathers, Ashakarati Mam, Potio Tamer at the time. It's that simple. Why did God do this? Because you abandoned the covenant. They worshiped other gods. They bowed down to them. They bowed down to gods that that knew that they knew not. And he did not apportion to them. Rashi says, even after worshiping them, the people did not become aware of there being in them any divine power. He did not give them as their portion. We worship stupidity. Right? And they, yet we attributed divine powers to it. God will be angry at this land to bring upon it all these curses that are written in this book. It's a little depressing. But 
this is the blueprint to protect ourselves from sinning. And God removed them from the soil because of God with anger and fury. He sent them to another land. That's us. And there's a big Lamed here. What's the reason for the big Lamed? The big Lamed is to emphasize it, the way it magnifies it, that we're sent away by God. And now we have the verse that's told us. Now we're okay. So you're saying we're going to be sent away for because people sinned. But it's not our fault. We didn't do anything. So we're being told, yes, it is your fault. It's your responsibility to stop the people from sinning. So, but then you said, how can I function like this? How is that? Am I going to stop? You know, like probably more than 90% of the Jews in America don't even care about anything related to the laws of the Torah. So how am I going to stop them? That's a good question. So first they said, It says the secrets are for Hashem, our God, and the revealed ones are for us and our children until this day. All the words of the Torah. So if you look in the Torah, when you write the Torah, there is 10 dots in this in, in this verse, above the words, Lanu Vanenu Ad. And so for us and for our children, and then the ayin of Ad. So that's to tell us that Rashi says, this is to tell us that we're only responsible for the revealed sins, but not for the secret sins. For the sins they do in public, we're not responsible. We're, we're responsible, but not for the private sins. Now you might say, well, wh- how am I supposed to stop it? Okay, I'm going to share something with you. You might not like this. Do the best I can. Why is why is there communal responsibility for a sin? If one person does it in public, why is it considered the community's responsibility? And the answer is the people only do sins that the community the community implicitly tolerates. Because, for example, how many people will sit down and start eating like another human being for dinner. Almost complete, total sociopaths. Like, so, I mean, what's, whatever the proper term is, John. Like just totally, no, I'm mean, not at cannibals. I'm just saying like people who are so far off the uh, spectrum, like they are just like, because that's a crime. It's like the, the crime that this community doesn't tolerate. But on a certain level, like all the sins that people do, the community still integrates the people. So it's like a saying that we we tolerate these types of crimes, or these types of sins. So therefore, in a certain sense, the whole community is responsible for the sins. Hello, Harold. Yes, John will get the last word for tonight. Oh, wow. so, well, I guess it depends on in our conversation how we're defining sin. Yeah. You would also, I would think that, right, like, a lot of the challenges that we see, right, in young people, right, they're learning from a community. Learning from a community. Meaning to say... Straight influencing. Yeah, and you see this, like the people that talk in a certain way, they behave in a certain way, they've learned it from the community. People that live maybe in South Lebanon, for example. I, I, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. Like, there is a community... That, let me just stop the recording, but you know, one of the things is that people 